Good morning and welcome to Grace Presbyterian Church. I'm Pastor Nancy. And I'm Pastor Holly. And we are a congregation that does our best to live life loving God, growing faith, and serving Christ. Jesus tells us that wherever two or three are gathered, he is there in our midst. We are two or three gathered today over the internet, and we have gathered today to worship. He is here with us. We're going to continue today in our sermon series called Vital Congregations, which is what helps us know what it means to live as individuals in a church with vitality in the world. Our first theme was lifelong discipleship. Our second was intentional, authentic evangelism. Our third was outward incarnational focus. Our fourth was empowering servant leadership. Our fifth was spirit inspired worship. And today we will be looking at what it means to live in caring relationships. So in this time, let us worship God. Good morning, Grace family. Welcome to this time of worship. We are gathering together through screens, but we are still united in love as one family. Whether you are a first time worshiper or a long time worshiper, you are welcome. Here we find a song for our soul and healing for our wounds. Bring your faith and doubt, joy and sorrow. Here we discover that we are still able to care for one another, even in a virtual world. Welcome home. God has been expecting you. Let us worship God. Love you guys. A reading from Psalm 147, verses 1 through 5. Hear God's word to us today. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God, for he is gracious, and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of stars and gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. God's holy wisdom, God's holy word. Jesus calls us every single day to be in caring relationships with one another and boy, have we had to get creative about doing that. But the truth of the matter is, we don't always care for one another the way we should. We disappoint one another, we let each other down, and we hurt one another. But the good news is we have a God that is so big that if we confess our sin to God, God will forgive us and give us new life and say, my child, start over again. So in humility and in faith, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Let us pray. God of perfect love, we are cleansed and claimed by the love of Jesus Christ, our Savior, and are called to love you and all whom you call beloved children. We know that we will fall short of doing this. We disappoint others and miss opportunities. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to reach out, to share Christ, and to be a beacon of hope, love, and joy to all whom you call us to care for in our lives. Hear now our silent prayers to you. Hear our prayers this day, Jesus. Amen. Brothers and sisters, rejoice and hear the good news. For Jesus came to this world. He lived, he died, and he rose again so that we could be called forgiven children of God. And so we are. May we celebrate this gift each and every day. Hi, kids. This message is just for you. 
Wow, there's been a lot of crazy stuff going on in our lives lately. You were on spring break and now you're not going back to school for a while. And I bet for some of you that is pretty exciting. But it's not always so fun to stay at home and not be able to be around our friends. In fact, there's two new words we've had to learn and that is social distancing, meaning we have to stand far apart from our friends. We can't hug them, we can't high five them. And that's kind of hard. But I want you to remember something really, really important. And that is that we have the best friend of all who doesn't have to practice social distancing. And that's Jesus. Jesus comes to us and he's there with us with his arms around us, just like my little joyful bear. He's there to tell us and whisper to us that he's with us and we don't have to be afraid. So let's remember that as we go into this week, that our best friend in the whole world doesn't have to social distance from us. How about we pray together? You repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you that we don't have to social distance from you. Help us to remember that you are right by our side and we don't have to be scared. And all of God's children said, Amen. Dear Lord, help us as we read these scriptures together. Come bring your understanding and reveal your truth. Come open our minds, hearts, and souls to all that these words of life offer us. We long to be continually challenged, transformed, and renewed by your word. May we hear your voice of life as we read and draw close to you. Amen. Our gospel reading today comes from the book of John. It's Monday, Thursday of that first Holy Week. Jesus has washed his disciples' feet and foretold his betrayal. Amid what scholars call the farewell discourse, Jesus pauses to remind his friends that his crucifixion will reveal his glory. Next, Jesus explains that he will be there with them only a little longer. The passage then climax with the call to love one another as Jesus has loved. As we hear these words, let us think about the ways that we show love to one another. I invite you to hear the gospel of the Lord as recorded in John 13, verses 34 through 35. I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Our epistle reading comes from Paul's letter to the Corinthians. In these verses, we get a clear sense of Paul's concern for the image of the church toward the world. He is seriously concerned with the witness of the church. Paul's greatest burden since his conversion was the salvation of Israel. If the Jews were going to accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah and the Son of God, his followers would have to give testimony in their life and death that Jesus Christ is Lord. Just prior to our reading today, Paul uses the image of a body a living and dynamic organism to describe the church of Jesus Christ. He goes on to say in our passage today that there can only be harmony when there is sincere love, caring, and compassion toward its members. Sincere and unconditional love among the members 
were to be the determining factors for the successful witness of the church. As we hear his words, let us think about the ways in which we share love with one another in this community. I invite you to listen to God's word as recorded in Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 18. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I read somewhere that we all have about five people who are in our inner circle, those that we deeply care for. Now that can change over time and some of them are family members. Other times they're their family that we have created, our tribe, if you will. They know our histories and our secrets and they still love us anyway. These are the five ones with whom we are honest that we can tell the deepest, darkest longings of our hearts to. Now the next layer out has about 15 people and we call them friends. We're pretty tightly interwoven, but not as much so as that circle of five. We may do things like go to lunch or play cards or work together. Then moving one layer out, we have a group of about 150 people in what we might call acquaintances. Now, I'm sorry to tell you, but nobody has 1,500 friends, as they say on Facebook. Now, so, so the theory is that we naturally have five friends with whom we're close, 15 friends, and 150 acquaintances. We do it naturally as a way to help us manage our emotions. Now, science has proven that we have a close circle of friends. It will influence our health. It influences our health on a cellular level, from our immune system to our cardiovascular system. Close friendships affects our health, not just mentally and emotionally, but physically as well. Of course, that's the way God created us. God created us to live in community. In fact, when God first created humanity, he created man and said, it is not good that man should live alone. So he created woman. Now I start here today because we're talking about community today, the church community, and how we can celebrate caring relationships in that church community. I think it's timely that our subject for today is caring relationships. Could there be a more important time in our lives for us to talk about caring relationships than right now when we're all staying home due to COVID-19? Caring relationships is one of the seven marks of vital congregations, and it's symbolized by two hands coming together, both in joy and in sorrow, walking with others in tragedy and in triumph, enabling us to be loving and real. It speaks to belonging and authentically sharing who we are with one another. A few weeks ago, I was leading a Sunday school class on the vital signs of a church and I asked each class member to tell us why they had decided to stay at Grace after first visiting. And almost everyone said, friends, I felt like I made friends here. It was a loving and warm community. You know, caring relationship is the mark of the church 
where this family shines the brightest. I think we do this well. We are welcoming and affirming, and we try to offer hospitality to everyone we encounter. But if we go back to that opening idea that we only have so many people that we can be connected to, how can we be a caring community? How can we be the caring community that Christ calls us to be? How do we love so many people? If we can really only handle four to five close friends, how can we be friends with 250 people? I have to say you've done an amazing job of that. It touches my heart when I hear the help and caring that you do as a church family. The ways in which you sit with a sick member or help someone move. When you bring lunch to someone who's grieving or you help someone with home repairs. Maybe you've put up Christmas lights for someone or given someone a ride to a doctor's appointment. Calling someone when they're absent from church. Those are all wonderful ways that you show love to your church family. But how do we do this in the midst of quarantine? We can't go sit with someone at the hospital. We can't give someone a ride to the doctor and we can't uh, make hospital visits. Now, while we're living in unprecedented times and we're all trying to figure out how to function in this time, the unique situation provides us an unprecedented opportunity to share love with our friends and family. Staying at home is a priority, but we need to do everything we can to make sure social distancing doesn't become social isolation. And that takes an intentional effort on the part of each and every one of us. At the core of our relationship is Christ loving us. In our gospel reading today, we heard some of Jesus' last words that he gave to his disciples. And many think these are some of his most important words. After washing the disciples' feet, he said, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. You see, to be a disciple is not just to be outwardly aligned with a Christian church or a Christian name, but to be miraculously changed by his spirit, changed into a person with a heart full of love. And that love is to be, as Paul wrote to the Romans, genuine. The love that Paul talks about in this chapter describes a familial type of love. The love you have for your mother and father or brother and sisters. In the Christian community, we are to love one another as we love our family. And it's not only to be genuine, he says we're to be devoted to one another in love. That means our actions or to show that love. So how do we do this love within the context of social distancing? Paul continues in his letter and spells out what that might look like. And one of the ways he says that we do that is that we persevere through prayer. I believe that one of the best ways we show love for one another is when we pray with and for one another. Now this may not seem like you're doing something, but you are, your prayers make a difference. We pray for another every single week in worship. We have a prayer group that meets together over the internet at this time, and they pray for the needs of this community. We send out a prayer list over email for you to use in your own personal prayer time. Now, I know that sometimes I hear some of you say that our prayer time and worship goes on a little long, and other times you don't feel comfortable sharing your prayer needs within the community of faith. But when we do so, we are loving one another genuinely. Praying helps us knit, praying knits us together as a loving, caring community. I was really touched the other day because Raymond sent me a text and he said, Shanice said to me, Daddy, it's time for us to pray for Pastor Nancy, Pastor Holly, Hope, our church, our teachers, and all our friends in the family of God. Even a four-year-old knows how important those prayers are. Paul also says that we're to rejoice with one another in rejoicing and weep with one another in weeping. That is part of what we do when we share our concerns and celebrations. Now, the next step is how we follow up with prayers. You can do that by sending a text on your telephone or by emailing someone. 
or by picking up the phone and calling someone and asking them about their prayer request. It's a great way to show love. When people are really hurting, let them know that you hurt with them. And when they're rejoicing, celebrate with them. So what else can we do while we're confined to our homes? You can post spiritually uplifting pictures and stories to Facebook. I think we're all tired of hearing the stories and rantings about hoarders and empty shelves. But you can show love by posting pictures of your family or pictures of flowers in your yard or a story about the way someone blessed you. And that will bless each one of us. Now, if you are not an at-risk person, there are some other things you can do. I read a story yesterday on Facebook about one of my neighbors who heard her ring doorbell chime and she went and looked at the video and from the video on her phone, she could see that outside her neighbor was mowing her yard. This was an elderly woman who wasn't able to mow her yard for herself and she was blessed. I also read on Facebook yesterday how the president of our neighborhood association was sending around a message that anybody who was at risk and needed groceries brought to them he would arrange for someone to pick up groceries and deliver them to their doorstep. You can check in with your neighbors and your friends at church and your family, anybody who might be at risk and see if there is a way you can help them. You can write letters. We forget sometimes about writing letters and is it wonderful to get snail mail that isn't a bill? You can challenge yourself to call one person a day, just one person, someone in this congregation to see how they're doing. And you don't have to talk a long time. Just check up with them on how they're doing and how they're handling this isolation time. Another thing you can do is you can have a group meeting over Skype or Google Hangouts or Zoom. Tina Arroyo's small group on Wednesday night met over Zoom and all their members were able to do Bible study together and share their prayers and concerns together. Our generosity team on Thursday night met over Zoom, and next week our session is going to meet over Zoom. You can find a way to meet with people and you get to see their faces and hear their voices, and it's a wonderful way to be in community and share caring relationships. Now, all these things are great, but there is a catch. A caring community is not one directional. It cannot be only about how we help others, but it's how we allow others to help us. It's being honest when you're struggling and now allowing others to share your pain. It's calling the church office or your deacon when you're going in for a test or procedure. It's calling the church office or a deacon if you hear of someone else who is ill. It's being vulnerable and trusting people to show up. When my mom and sister were both sick, I felt like it was such a long time. My mom was sick for 10 years and my sister for seven. And I thought people kept getting tired of me hearing my prayer request. I'd raise my hand, pray for my mom and sister. Pray for my mom and sister. Well, how are they doing? Well, not very good. And I thought people would get tired of that. And so I told my husband that I wasn't gonna ask for prayer anymore. And he said, don't do that. And other people asked. And so I continued to ask for prayers for my mom and my sister and people wanted to pray for them. They wanted to support me by praying for those that I loved about. Now, as you've heard me say before, my mom was bedbound in our home for about 10 months, and we had an aide who came to stay with her uh, half of each day. Well, there was one weekend when I had a wedding, and Kevin had to be out of town, and I didn't have anybody to stay with my mom, and the aide couldn't come. But there was a woman in our congregation who at one time had been a certified nursing assistant. And she called me and said, please let me come stay with your mom. I said, you don't get it. You don't understand what this means. You have to change her diapers. You have to feed her food. You have to give her a glass with a straw in it and try to help her want to drink. She said, I can do that. I can do that for you. And she did. And I have to tell you, it was a big step for me to let somebody come into my home and be in such an intimate situation and help me. And it changed my life. Now, obviously at this time, we can't go sit with people who are ill, 
But if you tell us your needs and it's possible, we will do what we can to help you. Now, sometimes within church families, there are conflicts, just like in any family in your own home. And we know we've had conflicts here before. Sometimes they're theological. Sometimes they have to do with how we design the worship area. And other times they have to do with the songs we are singing. These are normal emotions and they happen all the time. Anything that has to do with our faith touches our hearts, which means we get passionately involved in how we feel about those things. And sometimes it's really easy for us to dig in our heels and say, my way is the right way. I know all the answers. Listen to me. But a church that embraces caring relationships is able to listen to one another, talking through conflicts, respecting each other's opinions, building bridges, and being agents of reconciliation to one another. We don't ignore conflicts or, or avoid them, but we work through them. We work to bridge the gap and to be agents of reconciliation to one another. Within caring communities, when there is a conflict, we believe that Christ's reconciliation will abide and we trust one another to be honest and open with our feelings. Now, as we're going through this pandemic, there's lots of criticism about what is and what isn't being done. And there are many people who believe they have all the answers. It's important that we don't label somebody as overreacting or underreacting. Everyone is dealing with this in the best way they know how. But what we can do as a family is listen to one another. Allow others to have their personal opinions without criticism. I think it's okay to say, I appreciate your thoughts. I think this way, but you may think differently. And you know, neither one of us knows all the answers. So it's good for us both to hear one another. It's important to be ourselves, but it's just as important that we don't put others down for believing differently. One of my favorite quotes, which is attributed to lots of different people, is, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Friends, in all things, love is the answer. Years ago, a woman who was around 45 walked through the doors of our church. Now, this was when we met in the church garage and we just had a gravel driveway that came up to the front door and it was often very muddy. In fact, cars frequently got stuck in the mud. And this woman couldn't figure out where the front door was. So she walked around the back of the church house to what was our porch at that time where we kept our lawn mowing equipment, our rakes, our ladders, and all kinds of other junk that we didn't want in the church house. So it was a mess. And she climbed over all that stuff and she walked through the back door. And I will never forget as she opened that door, seeing her face, and she looked like she just stepped out of Vogue magazine. She was dressed impeccably from head to toe. Her hair was perfect. Her makeup was perfect. She had on hose and heels, and she walked into us sitting there in our shorts and our t-shirts and our ball caps. And I thought, oh no, this lady will never come back to Grace. But she did, and she loved our ragtag group of disciples. She became deeply spiritual, attending Bible study, coming to an exercise class we had twice a week, participating actively with our mission outreach, and visiting others in the hospital. She often told me that she found her Garden of Eden here, and Christ completed her life here. Now, I know Christ wasn't in the Garden of Eden, but in her opinion, grace was a paradise, and it was here she developed a relationship with Jesus Christ that saw her through all of life challenges. About a year after she had been here, she had a recurrence of her cancer and she became ill very quickly and went downhill very quickly. During that time, we were really close and spent a lot of time visiting and in prayer and Bible study. And people in the church took meals to Robin and her husband, Ray. They came to visit her in her home and in the hospital. They sent cards of encouragement to her. As she was breathing her last breaths in the hospital, I asked her what she wanted me to pray for. And she said for restoration. 
I want to be restored to God. And that's what I prayed. And a few hours later, she very peacefully took her last breath. We gather here outside on the church lawn to celebrate her life and give thanks to God for her being a part of this congregation. Now, she had only moved here about a year before she became ill and died, so her husband flew me to Atlanta to have a second funeral there for all of her friends who lived in that community. And the service was packed. After the worship service, I had the opportunity to meet her friends who lived in Atlanta, and they told me over and over and over again how much she loved Grace Presbyterian Church. And she told them how the love she experienced here through people changed her life and brought her into a relationship with Jesus Christ. People said they couldn't believe the changes she had made. She said that this was the kind of church she had always wanted to be part of, a place where you could be honest and genuine about your concern, a place where you could be uh, accepted by others, a place where you could be very genuine about your faith and authentic, a place where people helped one another. Friends, that is what a church that embraces caring relationships is all about. It's a place that welcomes people, that lets them share their differences, their faith, and their doubts, that shows love and acceptance, and is with people in the hard times and the good times. I know this is a really hard time. Many of us are struggling with being home alone. Some of us are worrying about a family member who has tested positive for COVID-19, and others are worried about who might be the next one to test positive for COVID-19. Know that God is with you, and God will give you all you need to live an abundant life, even when you're in quarantine. For as it says in 2 Timothy, God did not give us a spirit of fear, but rather a spirit of power and love and self-discipline. You are loved by the one who got down and washed the feet of his disciples. You are loved by the one who gave his life on the cross so that you might be forgiven and live an everlasting life. Friends, you are loved by the one who calls us to love one another. May we do so. And may we realize that there is nothing in life or in death or in quarantines or in COVID-19 that will ever separate us from the love of God is found in Jesus Christ our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and most holy God, you have loved us with a love that is uncomprehensible and you call us to love one another. Show us the ways we can do so. Help us to be creative in ways we can reach out to our neighbors, to our friends, to our family, to our members of this church, that we can encourage one another and lift them up. Above all, give us a hunger for prayer so that we may pray for one another. And Lord, we ask that you be with all of us in this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you now to join with me as we affirm what we believe by using the affirmation of faith which is on the screen for you. Let us affirm together. We believe in God, who is love, and whose love is manifest in all creation, in our lives and in all people. We follow Christ, who embodied God's love, in his life and ministry, his death and resurrection. He filled us with that love. We live by the Spirit, the presence of God's love in us. In that love, we participate in the church, the body of Christ. We love God by loving our neighbors through our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service. Love is our faith, and it is a gift from God. We thank God and ask God's blessings that we may love in the name of Christ and the power of the Spirit to God's glory. Amen. As I said in the children's sermon, we have a God that loves us so much that there is no social distancing from God. 
God is right now holding each and every one of us in God's arms, saying, my child, I love you. So let us turn to God in prayer. Holy Christ, as we live under your word, we are taught that we are to call upon you in times of praise and laughter, in times of uncertainty and pain. We know that all of life is precious, and we begin today by thanking you for the joy of life given to us in birthdays. Today we lift to you and celebrate with those in our family of faith who are having birthdays this week. Don, Jail, Terry, Hannah, Lucas, James, David, and Julie. Fill their special day with your joy and may this year be a year where they walk with you each day, knowing deep inside your great love for them. We also give you thanks for love and relationships as we celebrate anniversaries. Bless Calvin and Betty, JC and Joanne, and David and Madi. Continue to nurture these couples in their love for one another and for you, helping them to always remember that love is sustaining and never gives up. Indeed, Lord Jesus, remember us. O oh Christ, help us remember you. Jesus, by remaining faithful till death, you show us the road to greater love and caring relationships. Jesus, by taking the burden of sin upon yourself, all the burdens of the world, you reveal to us the way of generosity. Jesus, by praying for those who crucified you, you lead us to forgive without counting the cost. Jesus, by opening paradise to the repentant thief, you awaken hope in us. Jesus, come and help our weak faith. Create a pure heart in us. Renew and strengthen your people and empower us to be your church in the world now more than ever before. Jesus, your living word is ever near. May it live within us. May it protect us always and bring us hope in the midst of this chaos. Holy living Christ, hear all the prayers of your people. Your world is praying much. Hear us. Hear the prayers of those who are sick, not only with COVID, but all who long for their bodies to be healed. Hear the prayers of the sick who cry out to you for peace, for healing, for hope. Hear the prayers of the anxious who watch and wait and try to sleep. Help us find calm and rest and hope. Hear our prayers for those names we lift before you now. Holy Christ, we ask that you hear the prayers of those who grieve. Grant them the peace of the resurrection and hope for a new day. Bring hope and wisdom to our medical personnel and scientists as they seek the best ways to treat and care for the sick and keep them safe and healthy. We pray for those fighting for our freedom and for the safety of those they love. We pray for the leaders of all nations. Help us to be gentle with one another. Place your spirit of compassion within us and have compassion for us when we falter and fail. Jesus, your spirit in us is a wellspring of life, never ending. Hear us and help us to hear you. For we open our hearts to you praying all this with the world around us and remembering how you taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
So even though we aren't meeting face to face, Jesus still calls us to be the church, to offer ourselves, our lives, and our finances to keep the church alive in the world. So in this time of offering, just take a moment to offer yourself to God today. And if you are able to help financially further the ministries of Grace Presbyterian Church, feel free to use our online giving, which you will see a link below, or you can mail a check to the church where the video and the address will be posted at the end of the video. Let us pray. Loving God, things both invisible and visible we give to you. Our finances represent our work and express in a clear and visible way our love and thanks. But we also bring as an offering to you our very lives, the fragile dreams and hopes that we have. These are the invisible gifts and what sustain us in our life of faith. Receive all that we have brought in love and use it to do your will. In your holy name we pray. Amen. I charge you now to go forth and find one person that you can do some kind of loving act for. And in that way, you're loving as Christ told us to love one another. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you. And let all God's people say, Amen.